I think when people say there needs to be an immigration reform, immigration is broken, you almost have to pry them what, like, well, in, in what sense? It's like if you complain to your friend, man, relationships suck. Right. Well, in, in, in what sense? Yeah. Right. Uh, here it seems it's more a case of this agency has one little stack of papers, this other agency has a different stack of papers. Oh, yeah, no, you can't have an easy time getting the information between them. I, I could complain about it so much more. It's way worse than what you think. What people don't understand about immigration is that it touches on every aspect of what you call life. Welcome to Orbital Media, where we learn about human perspective, culture, and society one conversation at a time. Immigration, a topic discussed so much, but which often falls into a binary of good versus bad, without really much sense of complexity. But it's a very complicated topic, and there's a lot of nuance to the idea of people moving from one place to another. So we're going to talk about immigration, what maybe some of the misconceptions are that you might be hearing in the general mainstream media, and we want to get that information from an expert. So today I am joined by Joseph Seng. Uh, Joseph, I hope I pronounced your last name correctly. Yes. Uh, Joseph, you are an immigration lawyer. So very quickly, what do you do? What does an immigration lawyer do? As an immigration lawyer, we help clients, but clients come in all sorts of different circumstances. It's not just people who are overseas needing visas to come to the United States. Let me kind of break it down for you so you could see the complexity of it. And that's potentially the first misconception, right? So there's people who want visas to come to be a student. There are people who want to get a visa to come and work. But then there are also people who are here wanting to stay and get a green card. There are also people who tried or are trying to come, but they can't come because of certain of their family background, because of their work experience. And so they can't get a visa and they're trying to. Maybe the consulate shut down and they're already granted a previous visa and they try to come in. There are people who have green cards already who want to be citizens. There are people who have green cards who've left the United States and they can't come back and they want to come back. There are citizens who've left the country and want to abandon their citizenship. There are people who have crossed the border illegally, but if you kick them out and deport them, it will cause the United States severe harm. And so how do you go through that process to grant them a stay temporarily or indefinitely? So that is everything encompassed under immigration law. It encompasses non-immigrants, it encompasses illegal immigrants, it encompasses people who are trying to get green cards, it encompasses people who already have rights as green card holders or as citizens. And as an immigration lawyer, we are helping people in all spectrum of that journey and, and, and help them navigate that process. Okay, so I want to, if you're okay with it, define a couple terms up front. So for people who hopefully know what all these things mean, I just want to be clear that they, they're clear on the vocab. So first of all, the topic of a green card, which you're referring to, as well as something called a visa. Now, those terms are thrown around. I have a general sense of what those are. But for the people listening, could you de define for us sort of generally what is a visa? What does that mean if a person has a visa? What is a green card? What does that mean? And then a citizen, right? Is, you have a passport and you are a, you are a citizen of that nation. Yeah, so let's work backwards. So most people understand what being a citizen of a country is like. Being a green card holder is a lawful permanent resident, which you could think of it as like a baby citizenship. Now, a lot of people forfeit their green card. A lot of people's green card gets canceled. And so it, just think of it like it's a baby citizenship. It comes with certain rights and privileges, but it also comes with certain responsibilities. And for example, as a green card holder, you're technically not supposed to leave the country for too long. Whereas as a uh, passport holder, you can leave you know, easily and the consulates are there to serve um, citizens as opposed to just lawful permanent residents, right? So lawful permanent resident as a green card holder, you have, you know, basic rights and privileges. Now visa is a more like, it's a baby green card. You might be able to enter the United States. You might be able to work in the United States. You might be able to have certain benefits from the U.S. government, but it ends there, right? So a visa, think of it more like it's a ticket like that you bought to Disneyland and now you're able to enter the park and you can do certain things, but that's it. You're not, not an employee. You're not an owner, right? Whereas citizenship, you could think of, I'm an owner of this country. 
right? I can vote. I can right. do all these things. Green card, okay, you might like you're like an employee. You're you're here working. You have certain rights and privileges, but you're not an owner. So it's it's good to think of it in that way, right? Citizenship and then green card and then visa. They're all like baby versions of each other. And also, just so we we have the terms clear again, the basic idea of immigration, I understand it, is simply the movement of people from one place to another. And you can have internal immigration within a country. You can have international immigration, which generally when people colloquially say immigration, they are referring to the movement of people from one nation to another nation for the purpose of staying there for a long time, perhaps even permanently. Um, and then there's the concept of legal immigration and illegal immigration. Legal immigration being you have the legal permission and the right of the country you are coming to, to come there and to spend time there and to work and be present within the borders. Illegal immigration is you do not have the right to be within those countries' borders, given how you entered. Uh, I would love, just that's how I'm kind of describing it on the fly. How close am I in those general terms and terminology? And is there like anything in the meaning of those terms that maybe is like actually incorrect? And there's like actually a lot more to it than that. Yes. So legal immigration, the United States comes up with a really nice, sophisticated system arguably the best in the world on how to legally immigrate to the United States. There's family-based immigration. You get married to a U.S. citizen, your parents petition, your family petition to family immigration is complex. There's business immigration, you know, companies sponsor you, you get a national interest waiver. There's various ways for you to get a green card through the business route. You have to pay a certain fee, you have to file certain forms, you have to meet certain requirements. So those are considered the legal immigrant route to come to the United States to get a visa. Illegal immigration is when you don't do those things and yet somehow you are in the country or somehow you are still getting benefits. That's what typically people consider illegal immigration. Now, the U.S. immigration law being as humanitarian as it is, and this I think everybody will agree on is a good thing, comes up with exceptions, right? There are exceptions for certain people because not everybody is created the same way and every, everybody's journey is not the same way. So even though somebody might be here illegally, they cross the border illegally, certain situations, but because of the exception that is granted by Congress, and implemented by the Homeland uh, Security, they are still be able, they are still able to get a green card. And so, if you're saying it's illegal, it's kind of not exactly right because it is part of the law, right? It's it's an exception. It's granted in the law, so it's not you know not the law, it's not illegal. But it's it's better to think about it in a sense, or they they are the exception. They're not following the normal rules and channels, but for the sake of America, for the sake of U.S. citizens, for the sake of companies, these people who might have violated the law, these people might have been inadmissible to come into the United States, these people who should be deported, well, we are granting them an exception so that they can stay in the U.S. for the benefit of the government, right? So that is quote unquote, illegal immigration. Could you give uh, maybe one or two examples of this idea of elite, this exception to illegal immigration where you're here in the country illegally, but there's some kind of an exception that means we are going to allow you to stay? Yes, there's so many good examples. So let's say you are a, you, you work for the military, whether you're in the reserve or you're an active armed force or you're a veteran, you fall in love, but it turns out this person that you ended up marrying is he, she, he, you know, crossed the border illegally, entered without inspection. Now, it is tremendously hard for that person to get a green card because they entered without inspection. They were not formally granted a visa. They just kind of crossed it illegally. The United States government says, well, because they are married to a armed force officer, right? They are married to a military personnel. We will basically grant them parole in place, let them stay legally, and then allow them to get a green card, provided that they meet other background checks. So that's an exception, right? That's an illegal immigration. They're granting it based on humanitarian grounds. 
here's another thing. Let's say they they're let's say they're not married to a U.S. military personnel. They're just married to any normal U.S. citizen. If deporting this illegal immigrant will cause extreme hardship on this U.S. citizen or on this lawful permanent resident, right? Then the United States government is essentially saying, okay, because if we deport you, even you know you you came you you violated laws, you came in illegally, but if we deport you, we are essentially shooting ourselves in the foot because we are harming one of our own U.S. citizens. Then that's not a good idea. So we will forgive you. We'll grant you a green card. There's only select per people that they qualify that for. You have to prepare a lot of documents proving that a United States citizen or lawful permanent resident will suffer extreme hardship. You know, so it's not easy, but you know, these are exceptions. I can go on and on and on about these exceptions, but these are quote unquote, the illegal immigrants, but there's policy in place why it makes sense to still give them a green card. Okay. Um, I would, if you're up for it, actually, I would love to hear from your perspective, what you often come across. This is whether it's in the news or in talking to people, you know, sort of misconceptions about immigration, whether legal or illegal, that you, again, in your personal assessment as an immigration lawyer, um, feel are often sort of floating around in the ether that actually is maybe not so true. I feel like the perfect analogy for this is, you know, we hear people say, just broadly, you know, immigration is completely broken. That is true in so many different ways, but the context in which you're saying it is different. Because some people might be saying immigration is broken because companies cannot get the talent that they need from foreign, from foreign countries. They need it in order to grow, and the immigration system makes it so hard to do it. Other people, when they say immigration is broken, is because they're family members that they cannot see each other. Other people say immigration is broken because people are coming in illegally. And so the illegal way is so much easier than the legal way, right? And so you're incentivizing the wrong thing. So everybody is looking at their own life and their own needs and their own wants through their own perspective of immigration. And they see it as broken, which true or not true, there are certain things that can be better in every single respect. But I think when people say, just blanket, you know, there needs to be immigration reform, immigration is broken, you almost have to pry them what, like, well, in, in what sense? It's like if you complain to your friend, man, relationships suck. Right. Well, in, in, in what sense? Yeah. Right? I, I, that was actually uh, the next thing I was going to ask, which was, because I hear this term a lot where they go, we need immigration reform. And then there's just no follow up to that. And I'm, I've yeah. often been scratching my head asking, what does that mean? That seems like a tremendously broad statement that I can't do anything with in terms right. of like learning anything. Yeah. Um, immigration law as it is is like a series of patchwork that's been done continuously over and over again. So, you know, you have a wound, they put a Band-Aid over it, and then there's another Band-Aid. It, it, it's, it's a patchwork, right? Uh, uh, you know, this table is missing one leg, so you put something underneath it. And then, you know, um, something else falls off, and then you're, like, propping it up. That's how immigration is right now. It's just continuously different patchwork of things to prop up. When people say they need immigration reform, the best way to think about it is you just need to tear the whole thing down and rewrite the entire immigration law so that it makes sense. Because over the years, every five years, every sometimes two, three years, a new patchwork comes in and, and corrects some, something, but it only corrects it for a certain small group of individuals. But it's because the whole world keeps on changing and the world is changing faster than Congress can take care of this immigration law. And I guess in your personal work, what do you find are often, because it sounds like there are a lot of major issues with laws that are, whether they're outdated or they just don't work, like in, in as least technical terms as possible, assuming you are talking to someone who is not an expert in this at all, what are some of the big problems you run into in your day, in your work? You know, on a, the work that you do, you keep feeling... I'm getting really confounded by these aspects of how American immigration works. I have to say, as an immigration expert, immig the U.S. immigration law is already the clearest in the world in, in so many ways. The U.S. government, United States Citizenship Immigration Services, they put their own training manual 
online so people anyone could see it they put their regulations they put checklists so they already put so much out there for people to see so that people could do it themselves yet because of the long drawn out nature of it because of policies keep on changing it is extremely difficult to encapsulate and to understand and so people um, get into trouble all the time the sense i have is basically the U.S. it makes it super easy in terms of relative to other countries with this these inf- this information, the rules and regulations being available online. You can read about them, but there are just simply so many of these things that for people to make sure they're always in compliance at any point in time is just very challenging. It's very difficult. Yes, because one little small mistake and the whole thing can be ruined. Imagine. Um, the immigration process to be like multiple board games all stacked on top of each other. And the rule books are there and it's extremely, you know, detailed. But if you do one wrong step, suddenly it's game over, right? And sometimes you can't redo it at all. And so your situation is just completely ruined. And so I think that's how I would like an immigration system. If you get the wrong visa, if you change your status the wrong way, and there's so many different agencies involved, and each one is responsible for one little sliver of what they're responsible for. The consulate, the airport CBP officers, custom border protection officers, and then there's USCIS government officials, and then there's actually more like the, the, the criminal courts. So if you do one wrong step, somehow it can have disastrous consequences. And even though the rules are simple for each step of the way, kind of, sort of, but one wrong thing could kind of ruin the whole thing. And, you know, there's just examples and examples of this. And so even for practitioners, even for immigration lawyers, keeping up with everything is actually quite a feat. Every day you have to like read and understand so you can, you don't want to give the wrong advice, you know? And so um, it's just, it's a complicated field in that sense. And it's, I'm going to take a guess that, of course, these agencies aren't talking to each other enough in that you're going to each of these places one at a time. There isn't a streamlined process of, you know, I think of like the medical industry where you've got your chart and it kind of transfers through a bunch of different places you go to. And it's not a case of, you know, you have to have a new chart at every type of specialist. It's just like, these are your medical files and they simply exist. Uh, here, it seems it's more a case of this agency has one little stack of papers. This other agency has a different stack of papers. Oh, yeah, no, you can't have an easy time getting the information between them. I, I could complain about it so much more. It's way worse than what you think, right? So let me explain a little bit. You know, the same immigration law applies differently to USCIS and the government in the U.S. versus if you're doing a consulate abroad. Right. We're talking exact same fact pattern, same parents, same child, same investment, same wait time, everything the same. Everything the same. When you say it's different for the consulate versus the, 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 uh, you said CIS. So what does your, there's a lot of explaining here to do because I'm, I'm trying to learn as we go along. What does that mean? What are those two different things? Okay. So the consulate, the embassy overseas, a lot of times they issue green cards, right? You go through the waiting process, the parent petitions you, you go to the consulate, you get the green card visa, and then you fly to the U.S. and the green card mail gets mailed to you. So they are in charge of a lot of the green card process. But so is the United States Citizenship Immigration Services under Department of Homeland Security in the United States. Okay, so, so they if are you're also, in the United States, okay. Right, and two agencies, both granting you know, uh, green cards, essentially. But one law applies to the USCIS is different than the law that applies to the consulate. So the same fact pattern, same father, mother, child, goes to the embassy and their green card is denied. But you come to the US and the green card could get approved. I'm curious. So so same group of people, but you would be two different sets of laws if you're in the US versus if you're, if you're abroad applying to a consulate. That's very odd. And I imagine there's a ton of other examples of that, of these weird inconsistencies. And it doesn't even make sense as to why there would be such inconsistencies for this. For example, the same, it could be literally be the same person. Exactly. Same family. And we've done a lot of cases like that where the consulates deny them, we bring them to the U.S., adjust status, and they get the green card. I'm specifically talking about Child Status Protection Act um, and 
and you know agencies do their math a little bit differently and so the consulates overseas are saying well i don't want to use that calculation method it's like <laughs> how can you choose to use which math right but but they they could choose i would be curious to hear about you mentioned the us is already the best system in the world and it's filled with all these other problems without sort of dunking on a specific other country are there other countries where you know a little bit about their immigration system and you could compare, here's actually what the U.S. is doing very well versus maybe some other countries with, you know, large net inflows of people. So, yes, um, I'm not going to name any specific countries. That's fine. But, That's fine. Yeah. But, but let's talk about just the general idea, right? So some countries, even very first world countries, they don't have a high number of immigration rate. They don't want immigration and they don't welcome immigration and other people don't want to immigrate there. So th there's a lot of countries that are like that. The U.S., because of its founding, has always been a very big nation of immigrants. Um, with all the bad rep that it gets sometimes, it, 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 is, it is a nation of immigrants welcoming a lot of people. So, so that's one thing I want to mention. The second thing is... If you just look at the past 10, 20 years, right, and especially just the past few years, what happened in Afghanistan, what ha what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening in Israel, and obviously Gaza, Palestine, where are most of those people needing to go to or want to go to? Primarily on the U.S. And the U.S., because of all of these incidents in the, just the past few years, sectioned off huge departments within each agency to prioritize helping people from Afghanistan, from Ukraine, from um, Israel, and from Gaza to try to get them in safely because there's family members here, there's businesses here, and they need them. And so, you know, if you think, I mean, why do we have a migrant crisis with millions of people, like 1 million, I think, per month, and then it went up to 2 million per month, crossing the border? They're, they're not going past the U.S. to go to Canada, right? They're, they're not staying in Mexico. They're not going to other countries. They're all pouring into the U.S. So, and, and that's per month I'm talking about. And, and this trend's been going on for like decades. So if you think about that, the U.S. immigration system has to deal with all the countries in the world and people trying to come here and the natural disasters that happen everywhere else. If there's a, okay, so I'm not even mentioning, you know, Afghanistan, um, Israel, Gaza, you know, let's say for the sake of argument, that is self-inflicted by the US, okay? Let's grant that argument. We inflicted that, so we have to help them. Let's say there is a volcano that erupted in a particular country. You know what the US does? The US says, okay, anybody from that country that needs to come here or who is here already, we'll grant them a TPS, so that they can stay here when while their country is going through that turmoil. Very few other countries have similar different policies like that. And a so TPS the US is is that a temporary permanent stay? What does that stand for? Um, I forgot. Or, okay, it's okay. <laughs> but it basically, it's like you can stay here temporarily because there's yes. a humanitarian crisis in your country. Okay, exactly. So the United States has a lot of these humanitarian laws trying to help a lot of different people, and so that's why the agency is so big, so vast, and with all these patchwork works. I'm curious, actually, this idea of the migrant crisis, you brought it up, is how is that currently, because it's an ongoing thing, right? Is that, how is that complicating your job? In, in what way, I guess, let's say if, if we were in a world where that is not happening, where you're not having millions upon millions of people sort of entering the country via the southern border um, illegally, what would your job be like versus that as an element? Or does that really affect your job much, much at all? Um, so it affects immigration lawyers for sure. And it, it definitely affects the immigration system at large. It doesn't really affect our firm because our firm primarily does business immigration and with some complex family immigration. Okay. Now, if these people later on get married to an army officer or there's a humanitarian need where we need to get them parole in place and then adjustment, then sure, maybe they will contact us and we can help them. But immediately, you know, there's nothing we can do to help people who are crossing illegally. But 
there are plenty of asylum immigration attorneys who just specialize in helping the migrants. And so with the influx of millions and millions, these asylum immigration lawyers are, are swamped and they just they, there's too many people that they have to help and they can't help enough of them. And there's also nonprofit organizations that are there helping and they cannot do enough to help. So they're completely swamped as well as the government who swamped the detention centers are swamped. Yes. I mean, in, like, for example, in New York, there are laws in place where they have to house all these migrants. And so even the hotels are swamped and the state budgets are swamped. So the migrants cause a major problem on the different infrastructures in the U- U.S., um, but it doesn't affect our firm specifically all that much. In terms of the work that your firm does, you mentioned it's mostly business and a little bit complicated sort of uh, family immigration policy. It, are there specific uh, parts of the parts of the world where you specialize, or is it more we're a firm and people in the U.S. from any different part of the world can come in and, and apply for our services, or do, is there sort of a specialization where it's like we really focus on? dealing with like this country and this country and those countries because we're much more clear on what like just the, the the deal is with you know people from this part of the world coming to the US versus like the entire planet. So most immigration firms do specialize in a particular language to help particular countries. And that just makes sense because they understand the people and the business and what they want. Um, we also special so we have that we have offices in Taipei as well as in Shanghai, but we also help a lot of different people with a particular need. For example, if you are a green card holder that have left the U.S. for a particular amount of time, usually over six months, a year, you get in trouble when you come back. So we've been helping people from all over the planet, including from people in Europe and people in Africa, all sorts of issues when they're trying to come back. We specialize in that. We also specialize in international students who get in trouble with their school and then now they somehow lose their status, how to get their international student status back. You, know, you can imagine a PhD student who been here studying for like eight years plus undergrad and suddenly one little mistake by the school, now everything is ruined and they, they get deported, right? Like that's a nightmare, but we help them fix that. So there are certain services that we do and we help everybody around the globe, but we also have offices in specific countries that we help a lot of people there. And in terms of, yeah, that actually, how does the law of the other country come into play in terms of the work that that you do, because I figure it's not just the it's not just U.S. law and how people need to be aware of that. There has to be this other side of the equation, which is the country that person originates from. Those countries have certain laws and regulations and all that. And if you want to speak about maybe just specifically China and Taiwan in that case, or if it's like I can talk about, you know, here's one example of a country. Um, how does that factor into the work that you do? So much. Adoption laws, divorce laws. Some countries, like Philippines, don't believe in divorce. So you can't get divorced in that country. But if you can't get divorced in that country, but if you're in the United States and you get remarried again, the U.S. doesn't believe in polygamy. So what do you do? Right. If you can't get divorced, but, you know, so... So other countries' law play into it, right? And and even U.S. law, like, for example, state law, let's say California, allows marijuana, but federal law does not. And so if you smoke marijuana in the state, that's legal, but because you violated the, the immigration and federal law, suddenly your visa gets terminated. And so state law, federal law, overseas law, the adoption law, right? If you are claiming somebody is your child because you formally adopt them, in that country, sure, maybe you complied with that country's adoption law, but the United States doesn't recognize that adoption law because they need to comply with the Hague Convention was an international adoption law, right? So you need to think about international law, you need to think about that country's law, you need to think about your own state law, and you need to think about U.S. federal immigration law. So it's an intersection of all of these, and, and that's partially why I love immigration, because you constantly learn new things. I, I, yeah, I'd be very curious, actually, if again, if this is too in the weeds or not able to talk about it, but like an example of maybe how law might be different if someone is immigrating from, and without getting into the geopolitical aspect of this, like Taiwan versus mainland PRC China, as an example of, here's how it's different when I'm communicating with law on our side versus law on the other side. So many, so many things. Homosexuality is permissible in Taiwan. Yes. Not permissible in China. It is legal in Taiwan now. Yeah. 
there are many places in Asia that it is still a criminal, it's a criminal act. But in the U.S. now, it is federally legal to petition a homosexual partner. It wasn't always. I mean, I think Doma was struck down. I think it was like 2014-ish. Yeah, 14, 15, so. somewhere around there. Yeah. So prior to that, you cannot petition your same-sex couple, your, your, your spouse, right? But but now you can. Now, what if you're in Taiwan, you can get married and you can petition them. But in China, you can't. And so what's the solution? Well, then you, you must fly out of China, go to a place where you can get legally married, and then immigrate to the United States based on the marriage certificate of a different country. You see how crazy and ironic that is? Other situations, China, China, Philippines, Vietnam, India. Uh, did I say Mexico? Uh, if I did it. In Mexico, okay. These five countries have a lot of people immigrating to the U.S. so that they have a backlog. So the U U.S. immigration system gives them a cue. Now you have to wait in line because too many people before you from your country immigrated. But Taiwan, Korea, Japan, other people are not in those five categories. So their line is much shorter, which means if you are from one of these countries, it will benefit you tremendously if you get married to somebody else who's not born in those countries and you can go wait in their line if, if you if you follow, right? Um, so for example- Yeah, explain, explain that again, actually, yeah. Okay, so let's say somebody from Mexico or India who have a long, long wait time, they get married to somebody who's a Canadian, right? And now, now they're married to a Canadian and now both of them want to immigrate to the United States, right? Well, if you use the Mexican wait time, it's super long, but Canadian line, it's super fast. So we could just use the Canadian birth place. I see, okay. So um, because countries like Canada and Japan and South Korea and Taiwan and you know Singapore probably, you know, like have much shorter lines compared to so many other countries. Um, if you can basically get into that line, then you go much, you go much faster. Um, that's actually another uh, question, which is if we, the idea of kind of um, when people talk about high skilled and low skilled immigration, they're like high skilled immigration and low skilled immigration. And those are these very big catch all baskets. Right. And I kind of we have I have my you know, what pops into my head about, you know, high skilled immigration, software engineer from South Korea, you know, um, low skilled immigration, someone who's working in construction. Um, and, you know, just being honest here, probably from what we would generally call the global south, right? Um, so how does that factor into, again, the work that you do? Do you specialize? Like we pretty much deal with skilled immigration. Um, or again, just if you have any takes takes on that, you know, because that's another big part of this the, the immigration discussion. Right. So most of the time, high skill and low skill that applies to business immigration lawyers, which that's primarily, you know, our firm. We do a lot of that. I mean, we do so much family as well, so I don't want to discount it. But at least uh, my department, we do a lot of business immigration and business immigration, high skill and low skill. The process, everything is the same. But typically our firm, we do a lot more high skill ones. Um, and but with that being said, I don't think um, I maybe I'm just so removed or so specialized. Like, in my opinion, both high skill and low skill is so critically needed in the U.S. that it will it would be shocking to me if anybody says uh, we don't want high skill or we don't want low skill because both are tremendously needed. So if you are yeah. trying to. Um, do you, and actually, follow up on that. Do you find when you're talking, and again, this is sort of the kind of subjective, not necessarily at your workplace, but like your life outside of work when you're talking to people who are not in your line of, you're, you're not in your, your field. Um, do you find that there is sort of implied like co commentary about, you know, high skilled or low skilled? Because, you know, I think in the late 20th century, the sense was it was always, you know, low skilled was, was viewed as the problem. Like, oh, they're coming and Americans are competing for jobs. Now there's also the idea of high skilled immigrants competing um, for jobs and that being a complicated uh, situation. Do you find one of those categories shows up more in people's like either positive sense or ire than another? 
I, I really think it depends on their their worldview and where they are, right? So if they if you are a software engineer and you are competing with a bunch of other people who need H1B visas and they are gunning 80 hours and they're doing all this stuff, it's really hard for you to compete. And so you will be disgruntled and you will not like the high skilled immigration because you're, you're, you're up against all these other people. Low skill, let's say you're a server at a restaurant and you know your wage is not increasing because these restaurants are easily able to hire all these other low skilled immigrants to do a lot of what you're doing. And so you don't have the bargaining power to increase your salary and you're at the mercy of the business and the business is able to do these low skill petitions then you might be disgruntled, right? And so it depends on who you talk to. Um, but at the end of the day, from my perspective, seeing the, the global economy, companies of all sizes, um, like the tech companies, can't find enough great talent in high skill. And low skill, you know, if you're a farmer picking apples and picking uh, fruit, you can't get enough people to come to the US to do these farm work, right? And so... Um, so from the business perspective, it is gravely needed, but from each individual workers, U.S. workers perspective, seeing your competition, maybe you have some disgruntled feelings mm -hmm. because your wage cannot be higher. What would then, yeah, this would be a uh, follow-up actually, if you sort of had a person from either side, right? This is the completely everything's amazing and this is terrible, shut it all down. If you were talking to the everything's terrible, shut it all down. Like what, you know, sort of your, your classic, like the super anti-immigrant type person, what would you kind of want to tell that person? Hey, look, actually there are some very positive things to this and here's why. I would tell them, you know, almost everything you enjoy in this life, let's just go through what you love. Everything would probably be not possible without the immigration system that we have, right? The population growth that we have, the economy growth, Silicon Valley, everything you enjoy from the Apple gadgets, you know, computer, Zoom, right? So many great things were created by immigrants and then these companies hire immigrants and then we're able to thrive as a nation because of so much, there's so much that it shows immigration is helpful. So if you want to just throw out the baby with the bathwater, well, you won't have the baby, right? So, you know, you and maybe you're okay with that, but maybe most of the country is not okay going back to the Stone Age period, right? So that's what I would say. And we could just talk about it. Like, do you enjoy your tech? Do you enjoy your low prices? Do you enjoy your standard of living? Do you, like, even though you're complaining about your standard of living now, but let's rewind this 80 years ago or 100 years ago. Like, if without the immigration system we have, we might go back to that. And let's compare to other countries, right, that don't have these massive immigration. Well, then maybe the population is dying. Maybe your social security will be cut in half. All these problems. So do, if you enjoy that, you know, well, then maybe you should run for president and see if everybody is going to be aligned with your vision. And what this would be more, um, it's not so much like, oh, we, I want to hear the anti side because it's a pretty you know, good case, but more the case of if you were talking to someone who is immigrating here um, and it was sort of this idea of like, there are people who are maybe disgruntled about things who live here. What's something maybe this person who's immigrating here should think about or should like take to heart and understand if they're moving to the US. American culture is very different than where you came from. So definitely learn about it because you don't you are in a new place and you want to respect them. You are immigrating to a new country. Try to learn its customs. You are immigrating for a reason. You like this country. And so learn its laws, learn its customs, learn what's normal, what's not normal. And, you know, and, and anything that you're bringing from your old country, what you found is normal. And if it's illegal here, definitely don't do, right? Because every country has their own customs and laws that actually is strikingly different than the U.S. And so, you know, don't bring those quote unquote bad habits over. I, I think that would be a very a very good one. There's also the other aspect, too, of um, this maybe doesn't get into immigration law, but I think about a couple people I knew, sort of these were like the parents of friends of mine 
where even though they had been in the country for a very long time, like decades and decades and decades, they basically had never learned English, which I personally found was very odd, actually. Like, and I don't mean that from like a, you know, anti-immigration standpoint, just the idea of like, how are you in a country for 40 years and you haven't learned the local, the language? Um, do you have any thoughts on like, is that a thing that you often, you sometimes have encountered in the work that you've done? And if you have a perspective on how that also factors in? Yes, absolutely. So we see this all the time and in every culture. And it's not just, we, we cannot just pinpoint only one culture, or one country. Oh, of course not. That. Yeah, it's, this wasn't like a one country thing. It was like very different yeah. countries. Yeah. And so it's all across the board. Now, I think what you should think about is what is the alternative? Should we have a system where we force everybody to learn English and to assimilate? And, and what is the benefit of that? Now, when you start thinking about that in terms of a policy standpoint under the government, under the law, you, you will probably realize, wow, if we do enforce that, taxpayers will have to spend a lot of money. They will have to spend a lot of money. It will probably curtail the number of immigrants and the process. And do we want that? And maybe the answer at the end of the day is no, it actually doesn't benefit us economically. If they can't speak English, well, then maybe they won't apply for certain benefits and they would otherwise get. And so the government saves money. Or if they do have to apply for those benefits, they will have to hire a translator. And that's money spent in the economy. And now somebody has a job. And so maybe we it's OK to not force people to assimilate. I've been practicing for a long time and I understand there's the citizenship test, which technically if in order to be a citizen, you need to pass the reading, writing speaking and civics test. I was young enough where I understood how USCIS used to be much stricter. They make you write a paragraph. And if you get a period wrong, a capital letter incorrect, you fail the test. So think about that, right? They say a sentence to you, you have to completely spell every single word correct, punctuation and all. How many people would you know that would fail this test right now, even going through university? Probably a good amount of people, let alone a 50-year-old, 60-year-old who just immigrated, right? So it used to be that way, but it moved far, far away from that, where it's like, just write that sentence. If a second grader, third grader can generally make out what you're trying to say and write, that will be good enough. And so that's kind of the standard in the writing portion now. Now, if you can't understand the English at all, you can't have a conversation basic, you can't tell them your name and your address, well, you still fail the test, right? But basically it's, are you, do you have enough English proficiency to survive, to hire somebody to help you? If you do, that's good enough. We don't care about the whole assimilation thing. So, you know, right or wrong, you guys, you, you could think about it, but in my mind, it probably stimulates the U.S. economy a lot more by not being so strict on the language requirement. The, the, so it's this is very fascinating because like I've I don't know anything about that. I just found it was sort of an odd thing, but I haven't thought about like the socioeconomic implications of why you would have a system set up in that way. But um, yeah, I don't know. Are there any other? This is sort of again like this is a very broad question, but sort of. Aspects of immigration, if we just want to do like a bullet, kind of bullet point here for our last kind of five, 10 minutes of things that you wish more regular people knew about or understood about immigration in the U.S. I think what people don't understand about immigration is that it touches on every aspect of what you call life. So there are an, an incredible amount of criminals, terrorists, money laundering from all over the world that wants to enter the U.S., invade U.S., harm U.S. citizens. So government agencies and partnering agencies all have to be involved. The CBP officer at the airport, they are partially immigration officers as well, but they have to inspect drugs and, and agriculture and all sorts of stuff like that. So criminal aspect of immigration is very, very much important humanitarian aspect the u.s led the treaty after world war ii to allow for if there is if there if there's persecution and um uh, based on race religion gender if you are suffering persecution we will welcome you 
right? After World War II, think about the, the, the disaster that, that happened. Well, we're part of that treaty that we led. Well, now migrants are coming to our border. Do we turn them away, right? There's the humanitarian aspect of international law. And then there's the economic part, Department of Labor. We can't let everybody in because then U.S. people would be without jobs. For any U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, if you think it's hard to get a job now, if U.S. immigration law is just relaxed a little bit, floods of immigrants come in will take your job easily overnight. So you have no idea the extreme amount of privilege you have to be able to get jobs by being virtue of a U.S. citizen. Like there's so much bandwidth that's helping you. But there's the Department of Labor that is integral in part of that. And then CDC, right, is heavily involved with that. COVID happened, who's allowed to come in, who's not allowed to come in. So, and there's religion and constitutional rights. You are a member of a particular faith and you want to practice that. You want to be a missionary. Do we allow missionaries to come here? Do we allow missionaries to leave? There's so much involved in that. And you know, U.S. in universities, U.S. universities would not be as rich as is this past decade. I would probably venture to say in the past 10, 15 years, major U.S. universities, I want to say the top 100, top 200 universities in the U.S. got twice as profitable in wealth and assets because of international students, because of the amount of tuition they pay. And so our university standing, the ability for us to do research and then propel the U.S. government and economy is in turn based on a lot of the tuition international students pay. And so I think when people complain about immigration or don't know about immigration, you just don't know how intricate it is connected to everything else in what we call life. And that those takeaways are you have the humanitarian aspect, you have the economic aspect, business and jobs, you have the criminal aspect, there is the academic aspect, people being in schools, and then you could say the, like the family life aspect too, uh, people that you're related to that you fall in love with, et cetera, et cetera, um, underpinning, which are massive, massive buckets of what makes the country exist and how it runs and all the complicated things around that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's interesting, actually, your, your point, uh, I'm just going to speak about the students where uh, having, after getting out of grad school, there were friends of mine who were here on visas. And, and I, from the bit that we talked about it, it was really the first time I kind of registered the amount of extra paperwork and the number of extra hurdles they had to jump through in order to get certain jobs and certain like lines of work, at least in, in my particular field, that were effectively off limits to them based on the type of visa they would have had to have gotten in order to get that type of job, uh, which I had, yeah, and sort of never really considered before. Um, and that was, again, me from the sort of the academic economic slant of that sort of, you know, that, that part of the whole picture. Um, which I didn't even think about. Like, I didn't know what an O-1 visa was for, I think that's the one for arts and culture, right? The, I think O-1, yeah. I think it's R-1. Sure. Yeah. Um, that's the one, at yeah. least in my, my, my neck of the woods, people talk about a lot. The O-1 visa for, you know, doing monumental things for arts and culture, so please give me a visa. Yes. The way that immigration is talked about in the public sphere that you find is sometimes, again, simplistic misleading is there maybe a different angle do you have a different angle on how you find immigration talked about in the public sphere versus in like the daily life people on the street sign of sphere or is it about the same as kind of what we what you just said i think it's generally the same i think the one thing i would like people to know and talk about more is how great our immigration system is that's something you almost never hear about i never hear but that it, 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 which is truly remarkable, you know, and again, you know, I, I want to put my name on this, that I think it's one of the best in the world, given all of its aims and goals. And so if people can know the benefits that it brings, as broken as it is, the benefits that it brings, um, it, 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 that, that I think that would change the narrative a little bit more. It doesn't mean it can't be, it shouldn't be fixed. It definitely should be fixed, but we're fixing but, a but great it's thing. it's actually... Like life could be a lot worse than it currently is. Oh yeah. I, I, I think that's a great note to end on because I would say the same thing. I don't think I've ever heard a, a positive thing about the system, even from people who are very like anti-immigration aside, even the pro side, it's always negative everything. 
the processes are negative, everything's terrible. So I've never heard anything positive. Uh, that's a really nice note to end on. And um, yeah. I think it's a good note we can all take away that like Thanks. we can have a little bit of pride in the American immigration system that it does actually work better than, than many other countries. Um, yes. Well, Joseph, thank you so much for coming on. I, I've had a great conversation with you. I learned quite a lot. And um, for all of you, if you made it this far watching, dear viewers, dear listeners, uh, thank you so much. Uh, don't forget to subscribe and like the video, uh, as well as check out more content that we have coming out in the coming weeks and months. And I will see you next time.